Our next speakers will be Kelly Burke and Kelly Koo. They are both professors of biology at College of the Canyons, and they'll be talking about how they brought together art and science. Kelly's? Uh, thank you, Kyle, and thank you to the TEDx College of the Canyons team for inviting us to be here today. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you for giving us a chance today to share with you our TEDx project, Life is Art. I'm Kelly Kood. And I'm Kelly Burke. And our project fits really well into this whole idea of perspective, because what is life? What is art? And can life be art? Our project was um, really something that stemmed from our love of biology and our great appreciation of art, and in biology, especially our love of the microscopic world. And we love to take photos of nature and in the microscope, and this started a journey that really began to sort of help us decide how we could present this world to our students. And we decided that art would be the vehicle to do that. So one of the questions that we actually wanted to address with our project was could a single image be used to convey two distinct messages? One that was purely scientific and at the same time artistic. And this type of a concept can actually be portrayed with the illustration that is on the screen at this time. This illustration is famous from a 1915 publication and it is known as My Wife and My Mother-in-Law. And if you guys look at this image, the first portrayal that most people see is a young woman glancing off into the distance. And this, of course, would be the author's wife. If you look more closely and you start to inspect the details of this image, you can also discern his mother-in-law. Here are her eyes, her nose, her mouth, shown as an older woman with a kerchief um, tied around her hair. And so, in fact, this idea that you could, in fact, uh, put two different messages into a single image uh, gave us the idea of using this concept in our art exhibit, which was known as Life as Art. And this project was actually housed in the College of the Canyons Art Gallery throughout the month of October and September of 2013. And in this project, we actually housed 60 photomicrographs representing different biological species throughout the entire kingdom of biology. And we use this basically as a vehicle to showcase the fact that biology can be art. And we use this as a bridge to get biology students interested in art and art students interested in biology. So the idea that actually biology could be used to inspire art is not necessarily a new concept. If you really think about it, for centuries, artists have used nature, and the beauty of nature is something to inspire their art. You can think about the ancient Chinese imperial carvers and what they put onto their vases or um, the embroideries onto the ancient silk of the emperors and empresses. You can think of Ansel Adams. Um, artists for centuries have been inspired by biology and by nature. Even I, as a child, was not really allowed into my mother's garden at times because I would go and I would pick all of the flowers um, because I always found a lot of beauty in the colors and the textures that you can find in flowers. And so this basically led to my parents buying me a camera. Um, they're like, Kelly, you can't just go out and pick all the flowers out of the garden. Um, if you really want to look at the flowers and you want to appreciate their beauty, here's a camera. Go have at it. And for some reason, I wasn't one of those people that's standing back taking a picture of a flower. I needed to get as close as I possibly could. I think this was the first hint I was going to be a biologist. Um, I wanted to get in. I wanted to find the details. I wanted to look at the structure, the texture, um, and also the intrinsic beauty that I could find. One of the things with this talk and with the theme of the TED in general is changing your perspective. So why I think most of us could agree that these images are beautiful, that they are artistic. And perhaps many of us might even admit that we have pictures of flowers in our house somewhere. Um, I want you to think about what would these look like under a microscope, because that's the type of projects that we created. So for example, this is what the daisy looked like under the microscope. And this is, again, a microscopic, tiny part of the petal of a daisy, or of that blue flower. And this is the texture that allows it to look like velvet to the touch. or of that red flower that allows that variegation of color that looks like it's a sun-kissed edge. And to me, when I look at this image, I am also someone that does stained glass, like Jane, one of our earlier speakers. I was actually so inspired by this that I'm already making a stained glass window pattern off of this. I can truly step away from this and stop thinking like a biologist and stop thinking, 
oh, I see cells and stomata and the flower's breathing and it's performing C4 photosynthesis. And I can think, look at the beauty in that image. Look at the representation of the colors and the structures and the shapes. Um, so moving away from this idea, I actually also wanted to take this um, to the level of cells in the human body because my job at College of the Canyons is a cell biologist and I'm always trying to get students to think about the human bo uh, body differently. So if you were to turn and look at your neighbor right now and I ask you, which I do to my students on the first day of class, I say, tell me what you see. Describe the person sitting next to you. Yes, there you go. Good job, good, yes. Um, usually they tell me I see brown hair, blue eyes, freckles, and I'm like, no, you're wrong. <laughs> what you see are 100 trillion independent living cells. Because everything, what life is, to be a living organism, a living being, you are made of cells. That is the definition of life. So I, I like to get my students to alter their perspective of what it means to be living, to think of the fact that we, as a living human being, are made of 100 trillion independent living cells. They're breathing, they're moving, they're doing different functions, they feel pain, they get excited. Um, it's hard transition for them because we're so used to seeing things at the macro scale. So I thought the same idea with the flowers, right? You guys, you guys saw how we transitioned from looking at a big daisy to that beautiful image. Why not do that with human cells as well? So in the next few slides, I want to change your vision of what it looks like to be a human to what my vision of what a human looks like. And this is something that I use with my students to also help them alter their perspective of what it means to be a human. So maybe perhaps you guys can help me guess what some of these cells are. Human bone. This is human bone. No, you're not flying high above the Earth as an astronaut. This is a cross-section through the human trachea, which is a windpipe. These are the flames licking off the page. This is skin. Neurons growing on a Petri dish. Human intestine. Doesn't look so gross. I always think this looks like it's roots of a tangled, gnarled old tree. It's a spinal cord. And one of my favorite images, rat intestine. Do you see the beauty in the images, though? Can you see how that alters your perspective of what life is? That we aren't just the sum total human, that we are these little tiny parts, that we have these intricate, beautiful universes inside of us that are communicating with each other, that are functioning together. And of course, many human diseases, I'm a cancer biologist, cancer occurs when those cells are not functioning properly. So for the last part, and hopefully, of course, I'm getting my students to make this transition, when did I make the transition that this, in fact, was art and not just biology? Um, well, probably first when I found a vase in my bird bath. So I took some water from the bird bath that's in my house, and when I did this, I found a vase. This is actually a collapsed rotifer, um, which is the smallest animal on the planet. But perhaps for me, the biggest transformation occurred when I found this guy. This is an amoeba, and when I was watching this amoeba, I watched him for a good solid 30 minutes, and he was crawling along the microscope slide, and he was like 10,000 points of light, and he must have just felt like someone's watching me, like a voyeur. <laughs> someone's watching me. What is going on? as he's crawling, and I was entranced. At some point, this was no longer an amoeba, it was a dancer. And it was no longer actin filaments pulling along an amoeboid pseudopodic moment. 
It was a ballet. So I think you can even go further than saying that this is a beautiful artistic picture to almost performance art with biology. So this was a very transformative, and I had to name this piece Tiny Dancer. And I could hear it in my head, Elton John singing. So as I leave you, I want to have my parting perspective change be this poem by Walt Whitman, O Me, O Life, of these questions recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish, what good amid these, O Me, O Life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists and identity, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse, that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? Hopefully today, our project will help you change your perspective of what biology is, what life is, and maybe it will have somewhat of a cellular aspect to it. So I've seen those pictures about a thousand times, I think, and I still love to look at them. Um, when we did our project, you know, we needed to sort of find a focus, what would that focus be? And it was really quite a journey. She is a cell biologist, I'm a microbiologist. So she's thinking about what is the human really, and I'm thinking about what is on the human really, what is in the human really, and you're about 80% non-human. So that is a very abstract idea to my students. What is microbiology? What is this microscopic world? What is a bacterium? What is a germ? What is a cell? And so this very abstract idea of microbiology um, and microscopic organisms sort of led me to think that, how can I make this microscopic world real to my students? And I'm always trying to show them images. I'm always trying to do um, practical kinds of things. But this art project really lent itself to that. Now, for me, this kind of started when I was in the third grade um, at my little elementary school in Colorado. And they gave us a little jar of water and a microscope and literally sent us out into the hallway and said, OK, go, go look at that water. And I was thinking, what's in this water? It's just water. But something really spectacular happened when I put that water on a microscope slide and I looked at it for the first time because there were brine shrimp hatching in that water. And to me, it was so incredible that you would look at this jar of water with nothing in it, and then there it was, this whole world. And I think, like Kelly mentioned with her, this was sort of the beginning of my formulation of being interested in science for my future. I was also very much interested in photography as a child um, with my little dates, you know, probably whatever camera she had, but that's okay. Um, taking pictures of everything. When I went to college, I got to uh, do a research project on rotifers, her little vase. This is the rotifer stretched out. Um, and I spent lots of time collecting water and measuring rotifers and counting their resting eggs and identifying them. And this, I think, began my sort of obsession continuing from the third grade with what's in that water? So now everywhere I go, I'm always thinking, hmm, are the rotifers in that water? What's in that water? You know, I want to find out. Now, as a microbiology instructor, one of my great joys is to be able to work with students with the microscope and get them really comfortable and get them to see this incredible world. And when they first see these protocells against a black background, they get super excited. But I'm very concerned about that literal world. OK, can you see the cilia? Can you see the? the gullet, can you see the flagella, can you see the nucleus? Um, and they're kind of just all excited, and I'm like, well, you need to you know, identify these things, right? So I, I, I struggle sort of with the art aspect of it, because I'm, I have a task at hand. As much as I want them to understand how beautiful the world is, I also want them to understand the technical aspects and the structures and the functions and that kind of thing. So as we're taking pictures, I'm always very concerned about that. And then I start taking pictures that are not, you know, for my technical standards, it's not in focus, and I don't know what's going on. And the other problem that Kelly didn't really talk about is that these things are alive, and they're moving. 
Now, the amoeba moves very slowly, and so that's okay. But these guys move really fast, and so we're getting these images of all this motion. And I kind of struggled with that, and then we would show them to uh, Larry, who was the art gallery director, and my husband, Vernon, who was our printmaker, and he was like, these are great. And I'm like, well, they're not in focus, and they're not this, and they're not, and they said, just step back and look at the image for the image's sake. And that was a really transformative time for me to just go, okay, you can see the motion. You can see the beauty of these, even though it isn't, you know, textbook perfect. So again, to continue with my obsession about water, uh, we're going to see some friends in Indio and, of course, the Salton Sea. And I said to my husband, oh, guess what we need to do? We need to get some buckets and we need to go down and get some water from the Salton Sea. And he's always game for anything. Um, this is his image of the Salton Sea. This is my image of the Salton Sea. This is a microscopic fish scale with a whole universe living on top of it. And so again, I'm always like, what is in that water? What is in that water? We have a faux lake in a neighborhood, fancy neighborhood in our town. Some of you might recognize this. And whenever I'm around there, I'm always like, what is in that water? So one day my husband comes home, I got you a sample. And I was so excited, I was like, oh, yay. And this is one of the charming creatures, Euploides, that was in that water. But still, if you look at it, there's still sort of that literal interpretation, trying to get it in focus, seeing the cilia, and that kind of thing. I did a project a couple years ago um, where I had to go get water samples. I was building Winogratsky columns, and Winogratsky is a famous microbiologist, and basically you take sediment and newspaper and water and you throw it in a two-liter bottle and stick it in your window, and then let the sunlight work its magic. So when I first did this, I wanted a saltwater column. Nobody ever makes saltwater columns, so I wanted to see what would happen, and of course I did get some beautiful diatoms. But I also wanted to see what kind of bacteria were in that. So I buried slides because I wanted to see what the biofilms looked like. And when I stained those with traditional measures, gram staining, I was really surprised because, as someone later in the art show said, pasta shells <laughs> were stained. So I went back when we were doing this project and looked at some of, some of the old images, and I began to start seeing things and appreciating shape and form and color and not so much what exactly is that, and why is that important? Did the same thing at the Santa Clara River, and this was another happy accident, where the diatoms are stained and the algae are continuing with their beautiful green, and suddenly it doesn't really matter what the image is of, it's what the image looks like and how that makes you respond to the natural world. Two years later, this is what my Winogratsky columns look like now. So just taking a drop of water off the top, and there it is, this whole universe. And now it doesn't really matter to me what it is. And I'm concerned about lighting. Does the light right? Is the balance right? Do, do I like this image? I mean, you take 50 of them, and which one is the most aesthetically pleasing? And suddenly I'm thinking, and Larry, our gallery director, was very proud, thinking like more of an artist than as a scientist. Because Larry is very certain that he didn't want our art show to be a science fair, he wanted it to be an art show. So we got a lot of good coaching. And when you're a scientist and you're making wet mounts of things, the worst thing that you want is air bubbles. And so early on this project, I would have looked at this slide and gone, ugh, don't let my students see this, it's full of air bubbles. But I started thinking, wow, what's more beautiful than that round shape? And those repeating bubbles and bubbles within bubbles and a lens and an image within an image, and suddenly this was one of the favorite of all of my prints. And when you see it large, it's just really beautiful. And really, it's just a piece of grass and water. <laughs> and then this, reds and blues and purples, and it's like, oh, it's really pretty, and I don't know what any of it is. But I like it, right? And then this, people started at the art show, really responded to this idea of recognizing things in these images and connecting these things to things they already knew. So some people commented that this looked like a cityscape. Some people commented that it looked like a semiconductor and all in the wing of a butterfly. The universe in a drop of water. Ultimately for me, my goal was to make 
the abstract very real to my students. But the transformation and the change in my perspective was really not so much taking the abstract and making it real, but appreciating the abstract in the real. Thank you.